I'm going to open the first notebook. So notebook one, data manipulation representation. So that's just so that we can make sure that uh, we have a strong foundation before we do any sort of statistics, we have a strong foundation about the Python that we need in order to be able to just play with the data, okay? If you, if uh, we don't make sure that we are not at ease with all of these tools, uh, then everything becomes a bit harder. But if you are at ease with this, then playing around, doing simulation, testing stuff and so on and so forth become child's play or much, much easier. And you can focus more on the stats and less on the language. Also, you will see uh, when we talk about data description and when we talk about data representation, already the way that we represent things can help convey a message, can say something about the way that we think, the way that we model our, our data or the process that we try to represent. So it's, it's not a neutral uh, topic, it's something uh, with deep uh, implication, with a lot of importance. And if you use the wrong kind of visualization, you might introduce a lot of bias in the way that you think about your data. So without further ado, let's go there. So you have a table of content with some link to uh, help you uh, move easily through all the content. And we will first uh, play with importing, manipulating, representing data. So this first little uh, cell here is mostly about, uh, about importing the libraries we will be playing with, pandas, matplotlib, and seaborn, pandas to import table, matplotlib to do some basic plotting, and seaborn is a an advanced plotting libraries, which is built on top of uh, matplotlib and which uh, allows you to very easily interface with pandas to make complex plot in one line or two lines. And then here, this is not, let's say, mandatory, but for me, when I teach online, it's very useful because this kind of forces uh, the figure to be kind of large and to have a large font size so that you can actually see the figure well on my uh, cast screen. All right. So first step first, before we start playing with the data, we need to import the data from a file into uh, Python. So here I will presume the most common case, which is that you have uh, your data as a table in a CSV or TSV file. So that means that it's a text file where you have different uh, different record, each record is a line, and they are made of several columns or several fields. And each field are separated by a fixed character that would be a comma, a semicolon, or a tab or a space, which are the most common cases. Right. And there, pandas gives you this very nice read table, or there is also the read underscore CSV. Um, comment uh, in order to be able to read your file. It's a function which has a lot of uh, a lot of options. Okay, to adapt to different cases. Maybe you have a header, so the first line with common name, a column name. Maybe not. Maybe there are some line that you should ignore at the beginning of the file or at the end of the file, and so on and so forth. There is a lot of option. Um, it's then up to us as programmers to spend a bit of time in the documentation of this function and to try and see what are the specific options which are the correct fit to our data file. So often time we look at the data file in maybe an external software, uh, maybe like a tabler, Excel or something, whatever, we'll see what it looks like and we then adapt a little bit our comment line in order to be able to read that, okay? And if your data is not in a CSV file, it's maybe in an Excel file, or it's in a, I don't know, XML or JSON file, um, Pandas has the way, in the same way that they have read underscore table, they have read underscore Excel, or they have 
read underscore JSON and so on and so forth. Um, and again, you can go to the website of Pandas. It's very, very well documented and can go much, much beyond what I can show you in the limited time that I have. But really, I encourage you to go to their to their website and browse through their documentation. That's the best way that you can learn and that you can play around with this function in the end. I just list here a couple of the most important options. So separator, uh, by default, it's for tab, which would be a TSV file, but you can change it to a comma for a CSV or sometimes some of these CSV are semicolon and so on and so forth. Header is uh, the row that you should use as column names sometimes and usually it's kind of the first uh the first line and that is the default uh is to use the first line of the file as com column name but sometimes this header is absent and so in that case you should just write header equal none all right so we always kind of check uh you know uh, this sort of thing and we don't don't hesitate to kind of change it to suit it your data uh, in particular and then skip rows to skip a number of lines. So for instance, some file have start with a, a few a few lines of blah blah about the methodology of how this file was uh, was created and so on and so forth. So these are is interesting to us as uh, as statisticians, but uh, not so much for pandas. So these are skipped with this option. And then sometimes there are some other ways like that you how do you encode missing value how do you can encode a true or a false is it with zero or one is it with true or false is it with yes or no and this you have some options that let you automate automate this sort of reading all right so without further ado here is uh one of the data set we will be playing with uh today and tomorrow and this is uh, census data from the Swiss population in the 19th century. And uh, so that's a big CSV file there. And uh, it's in this subfolder data. And we will read it with a rate table because it's a CSV. I just put here the separator as a comma. Otherwise, I use the default value there. And of course, once you have a data frame, you want to look it up to just check what's in there, what are the columns, and uh, has the reading gone properly, okay? And for that, the head function is quite useful. For example, if I had forgotten to change the separator, then, oops, sorry, then my output would be something like this, uh, and which here kind of clearly shows that something wrong happened, and I can kind of, you know, identify that the splitting of the, the field into different columns did not happen properly and that I should change from the default tab to comma to obtain this. All right. So once you have that and you are confident that stuff was read properly, you want to start to get to know the data more. It's quite important. So first off, you can just have a look at the dimension of it. So here, number of rows and number of column is in this uh, shape uh, attribute of the data frame, which is just a tuple with number of rows, number of columns. So we print that there is 3,190 uh, rows. Each row correspond to a commune. And uh, then we have 24 columns. And the, here are the columns. So year is um, eight, uh, 1880 for everything, then the number of the town, the name of the town, total number of inhabitants in the town, number of Swiss people in the town, number of foreigners, number of male, number of female, number of people in different age categories, number of people from different faith, number of people from different, uh, with different uh, primary language, um, and then information about uh, the district and the canton that this commune is in, all right. And then one thing which is fairly important to look at is the type of uh, the columns for two reasons. First, it will inform you about the nature of what you are looking at, but it could also be used to detect error uh, in data entry or in data reading. Here, for example, you can see that my town name is of the type object. This is kind of the type that Pandas uses for 
strings, okay? So it kind of makes sense. Tone name is a string, okay. No problem there. And the rest, as you can see, they are int 64. So that means that they are integer numbers. And uh, this, for instance, let's, if we had had here one of these, which was thrown as object, that would be a bit surprising. And that could be a sign that maybe at some point when someone maybe copied uh, the, some data into this table, maybe, you know, their finger slipped, they made a small mistake and there might be a wrong entry there, which would then maybe switch the type of the column to something else and so on. So it's something to check uh, just to be sure that you have what you expected and that each column is of the type that you actually expect there. All right. So far, so good? Yes. Okay. Is the zoom level of my screen okay? Can everyone see my screen correctly? Yes? Okay. Perfect. So then, let's move on. So, of course, now you have, you know, a table and you want to access part of it. So, there are several ways of doing that i will not necessarily show all of the ways uh so to extend a single columns uh, usually you just either use the square bracket operator with the name of the column there be careful that the name should be here strings which should be in between quotes or also you can use this uh structure there df dot and then the column name so you can use either this or df dot and then orainer there, this. These are equivalent. In both cases, we are return one column here. Then I also use a lot the lock operator. So lock will then let you select both which rows and which column you want. And you can each time select several. So for instance, here this selects all column. So this here uh, column there means the everything and between rows zero and three okay here so all columns row zero three here row zero to three and then i want only column total and time name okay so i have the time names there and i have here total number of inhabitant and there are all rows and the column total okay so this can be kind of combined as you want. Here you see that I access elements by their name. Sometimes it can make more sense, depends a lot on the data nature, to access things not by the column names, but by the column index, so its position, in which case you want to use iLock, okay? iLock for index localization. Uh, you have here a little link for the Pandas tutorial where they give a lot more detail about how to use lock or iLock and so on and so forth. For our purpose, we will focus a bit more on one particular usage of lock. And this is what happens when you create filter in your data for particular conditions. So that's when you create subsets in your data. And for that, we use a comparison here to create what I would call a mask. So that's a set of true and false values. So here we say, I want the df.canton, so the canton uh, column, to be equal to vd, which corresponds to the canton of rho. Okay, and that creates a mask uh, object, which I keep here in a variable. And then I will use a value counts method of panda series in order to just count how many trues and false there are in there. Okay, so you can see here, I have here 388 case where the canton was full and 2802 where it was false, all right? And if I look a little bit at what's, oh, sorry, there, at what's in there, I can see that here I have a bunch of trues and false. Here you can only see the false because they are in vast majority, but be sure that there are 388 true in there. And this here um, uh, vector of trues and false, I can give it to lock there in the field for the rows, and it will then return to me only the cases where 
we have a true here and discard the case where it's false. So that's a net, nice way of just selecting a specific subset of uh, of my data frame. So if I give it to lock this mask with then tone name, canton, and canton name, you can see that now I have selected only the things which are in Vo. Okay, and here are the different cities. Okay, and these um, these uh, these masks there can be combined uh, as much as you want. It's just that you have to use parentheses, and then you want to use the ampersand to mean end and the pipe to mean or uh, in order to combine them together. And then the way that it works is very much like you would think about uh, how you actually speak in English. Okay, I want tone which are in the town of in the canton of Zurich and where the total is above or equal to 10,000. All right. And then that are these are combined and then I get a mask which then returns to me only things which are in the canton of Zurich. We can check they are all in the canton of Zurich and the total population uh, total there should always be above 10,000 above or equal 10,000. And that's the case also as well, all right? So these can be combined as much as you want, as much as you need. So far, so good. All right, then, then we will check that uh, everything is going well for you. So you have here a micro exercise. So your goal is to use this sort of method to select the towns with less than 1,000 inhabitants, all right? and optional display only the town names and number of inhabitants. So with this micro exercise, then it's your turn to play. I finally shut up. And uh, I ask that when you are done with the micro exercise or where you think that you have achieved a, a good answer, just put a green tick uh, using the reaction so that I know that you are uh, that you are finished with it. And if there is any trouble, of course, ask a question.
Okay, so I don't see a lot of green ticks. I hope that everything is working well. I have put a very small hint on my screen. And oh, I see that maybe most people had just forgotten to put their green tick. All right, then. So it seems that most people have succeeded. So great, well done. So I'm going to then give a small correction. And uh, if there are no pressing question, we are going to move on. So let me clear the feedbacks. Up. So we have column D of the total. Okay, we want something with less than 1,000. So less than 1,000. All right, so now we have got our bunch of trues and false. And uh, then we just want to feed that to our df.log. So we just df.log up of this. And there we have all towns with less than 1,000. You can see here that all the towns are quite small. And uh, maybe we want to then show only the column uh, town name and number of inhabitants. So that's then uh, da, 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 town name. That's this column name here. And then column total. Right. And then that's what we get here. And we see that we have 2,460 uh, rows. So that's how we do that. You can see that here I have given the mask directly in there. Of course, I could have done something like m equal and then given m there, okay, for much the same result. And then, of course, maybe you are maybe you are afraid that something went wrong and you want to check stuff uh, and you want to be sure that you know you have indeed towns which are all under. 1000. So one, what one could do could say, okay, this works exactly like a data frame, this whole thing there. So there is nothing preventing you from looking at the total column of this subset here of your data frame. And then there are some functions such as the max function, which will let you know what is the maximum value in that column. And you see that the maximum value is 999. So then everything is under 1000. Okay, all good. So let me paste that in the chat, oh, just in case they want to have the correction and we can then move on. All right, so then you have some columns and uh, sometimes, what uh, you are given in the column is not sufficient. So maybe, for instance, you are given a uh, height and uh, and weight, and you want to compute uh, the body mass index from that, or you've got the weight uh, of the body weight and the weight of the brain. And rather than having these two uh, weights, you want to have the ratio of the two, then you want to combine columns. So for example, here, we want to have the number of people who are more than 14 year old and so for that we would combine these two columns okay the 15 to 59 and 60 plus year old and the way that you do that is actually very 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 simple you manipulate them as if they were single numbers but then you act at the scale of columns so here for instance i create this column 14 plus year old is equal just the sum of these two other columns and that just creates it like this and you see that this action has added um a column into the data frame which is automatically added to the end there okay so it's actually fairly simple there you just combine column with normal operators and you create new columns exactly what you would add an element to a dictionary and to drop stuff from a uh, from a data frame you use the drop function so you would say, for instance, which are the columns which you want to remove. Here there is a single, but I could remove several if I give them in a list. I give the list of the column names I want to remove. A little trick that you have to be careful about is that you have to say in place equal true if you want it to happen right away. If you don't use in place equal true, it will not change DF itself. It will return a view of the data frame without it so that you would have to catch it in a new variable. Here I use in place, 
Uh, and then we can check here, 14 plus year old is not part of DF columns anymore. So the removal was effective. This in place thing there is, I would say easy to miss. So uh, oftentimes double check when you drop stuff uh, from a table, just, just to make sure that you have not mistakenly forgotten to use the in place and so on and so forth. If you want to remove rows instead of columns, then there is a rows argument to the drop function instead. And then you would give the index of the rows you want to drop. Okay. All right. So far, so good. Yes. All right. So we start with very, very simple stuff, but I think it's very important to build together uh, this common ground, as I said. Being able to manipulate data easily makes all the rest much, much, much better. So then again, it's your turn to work with our first exercise. So the first one, we will just uh, build up from this micro exercise that we did just before, but you have to be, you have to go a bit further. So you want to select turn with less than 1,000 inhabitant or more than one foreigner. So you have to combine two masks together and then ask the question, how many tones are there? Okay, that satisfies this more complex filter. And then create a new column in the data frame representing the fraction of population, which is of, of the reformed phase. So that's the reformed column for each town. And then if you have a bit of time, what is the minimum and maximum value for this fraction? Therefore, more complex exercise, I will stop sharing my screen, let you work, I think for, let's say at least five minutes. Uh, Put a green tick next to your name when you are done. If at any point you are a bit fed up with it and you just want to look at the solution, feel free to just here and comment this line. And then you can hear when you execute that, that will automatically load the solution, which is in an external file. All right. So that's also you always have the solution with you. Okay. So then if that's all, I will then, uh, and let's do a correction for this little exercise. So first we wanted to select the town with less than 1000 inhabitant. I will just use the correction for that. So less than 1000 inhabitant or foreigners. Uh, oh, there's more than one there. And here just is more than zero. So there's one mistake there. So more than one foreigner. All right. So this mask or that one. All right, the pipe is a single or. The little trick there is that you have to use here this parentheses to enclose each mask, otherwise you will get errors normally. And then once you have that mask, there are several ways of looking at uh, what's in there. So for example, here I just use the sum function because it's false and true. So false are zero, trues are one. So if you make the whole sum of this, then all the ones sum together and give you the total number. Yeah, but then there is also this other method which I've shown you earlier, which is this value counts. Yeah, which gives you the number of true and number of, uh, of false. So here you see that we get the same count here. Then you, Question two was create a new column in data frame representing a fraction of the population, which is before. So, okay, let's go there. Let's then split that, yeah. So we want the fraction of reformed and it's just reformed divided by total. Okay, that's how you get the fraction. And then you put that in this fraction reformed uh, column. And then we just look at the beginning of that just to get a feel for what it looks like. And then what is the minimum, what is the maximum? So there is a min function and the max function for each for that column. And the minimum is zero and the maximum is 1.0. Kind of makes sense. You expect that among all of the commune of Switzerland, there is at least one when there is no one of the reformed faith and one where everyone is of the reformed faith, especially in 1880. Okay. Now a very small interlude. Uh, for the rest of the notebook, it's much nicer, much easier if I play with a data frame which has some fraction in them rather than uh, row numbers. And so that's, I will just create this DF fraction data frame there. Uh, 
and you can just look at how I do that. I create that if fraction as you know from the data frame with just at first the term name, canton, canton name, and total number of inhabitants. And then for each of these uh, columns there, here you see fraction of uh, speakers and so a number of speakers and so on and so forth. I will create a new column in DF fraction as the column divided by the total. So then they contain only fractions. So that's what we get now. We have name, canton, total number of inhabitants, and then fraction of Swiss, fraction of foreigners, fraction of male, fraction of female, fraction of different age categories, uh, faith, and uh, languages. All right. And that will be a bit nicer for the rest. Okay. So then we want to describe actually what's in there okay we want to start to not just show a little bit but go a bit further so for this my let's say um well, my best friend uh one of my favorite function for that is just a describe function so you can use that on a single column or on the whole data frame and for that when you do that for each numerical column you get this little um, summary of what's in there so the first line here is count. Uh, so that just counts the number of uh, cells where you have information. Here, it's all at 3,190. So that means that all, all rows have the information. There is no missing values. There is no NAs in there. Then the mean value, OK? So you have the average, basically, total sum divided by number of cells. So you see that on average, that is 892.20 uh, uh, inhabitants per uh, commune, that the average uh, fraction of Swiss is about 96% and so on and so forth. Standard deviation, so what is the average deviation from this uh, mean here? Minimum, maximum, and then the first quartile, so 25% of town have uh, less than this, uh, less than two, uh, 247 on 25 inhabitants, and thus 75% have more than the 50, the median here. So that means that 50% have less and 50% have more. And then here, 75, so 75% have at least this number, and 25% then have more. So far, so good. All right, so then you have that for all columns. Again, for me, that's quite useful also to detect if there are some outliers in there. Like for instance, let's say here, my minimum is 17. Very small town, but after all, why not? And my maximum is 61,000. Again, big town, but again, makes a lot of like, quite possible, right? If I had some negative number here in the minimum, then I would say, okay, something weird happened. I have made a mistake or there was a mistake in the file. If this value, the maximum there was something crazy like 2 billion, again, I would suspect foul play. Same thing here, these are fraction. If there is anything which is negative or above one, I would suspect a problem. So this is both to get to know the, the data, but also eventually to detect problem in there. And uh, there is none here, and I won't go into too much detail in there, but um, sometimes in your data, you will have NAs, so missing values. In many cases, it's not too, too, too problematic. It's just that you have to maybe exclude the rows when there are NAs and so on and so forth uh, in some procedures. And, or you want to sometimes do some imputation. So the NAs will be replaced by a set value or something like this. Here, you have two functions which are uh, helpful. First is isNA, that lets you detect missing value. There is a link to the documentation there and some example. And then fill NA to input to add, to replace all the NAs by a set fixed of values. Okay, depending on the data nature that how you do that can change a bit. So I don't give uh, any indication there. All right, but just know that this exists in case at some point you have some NAs. All right, so as we said, describe gives you the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, and different quartile. All right. Um, maybe one other describers could be the mode. So that's the most common 
value, especially among discrete data, or the max, uh, value with maximum density in continuous data. So if you imagine that you have a density plot, that would be the point where the density is the maximum. That's the mode. All right. So now that we have seen just how to get some bunch of numbers there, let's see how, that, how we can get a visual representation, OK? Because we have all of this computing power at our disposal, so let's actually use it to get some nice plot. For that, I will use um, Seaborn, so which are uh, which is uh, imported as SNS as a shortcut, and so uh, Seaborn usually takes either directly the column that you want, or when you want to represent several columns, you can give it like the name of the data frame and then the name of the different columns that you want to show. Uh, it's very simple of usage, at least in these places, and it can offer a lot of variation. So it's quite a nice library to play around. They have a very nice tutorial. So after the course, if you want to play around with their tutorial or, or gallery, I can only encourage that. So here, a single line, sns.ist plot for histogram plot, and then the fraction of Swiss, so the column Swiss of the DF fraction data frame, and this is what I get directly. It has detected that this is a Swiss column, so this is here. It would just use this as label for the x-axis. And for an histogram, the y label is count. And so you get here, and you see that here, most of them are very close to 1. But then you have a nice little uh, decrease there as we get to a lower fraction. OK, so that's kind of the default, very simple. And of course, this can be kind of tuned and played around with. So for instance, if I do the same thing, but now I say KDE equal true, so there will be a kernel density line added on top of that. And the color will be red instead of blue. And I will here set underscore title. So add a title, and this is a title that I will set. OK. So and now this is the result. And you can see here the density line has been added on top here. All right, so there are many options. Uh, again, this function have many, many options. I will show a few, I think, some of the most important ones to know. But it's important to, again, hammer in the point that variations are, a lot of variations are possible there. It's a, it's a library which is very, very versatile. And so spending some time playing around, having fun a little bit, you know, you're playing changing color, playing color scheme, playing with the visualization is is helpful. It gets you to be more, more versatile uh, and more flexible with these libraries. So do not hesitate to spend time. They have a very good tutorial on their website. All right. So, and then from there, we can maybe combine them and we can play with different, um, with different, uh, with different parameters that lets us see our data slightly differently. In particular, for the histogram, I want to just discuss quickly the um, the bin or bin width uh, um, uh, sorry uh, argument and uh, because it, it plays with how much granularity you look at your data uh, so for instance I will show you an example of multi-panel figure where on one panel I will show you figure directly it will be easier to explain on one panel, I will use the default uh, number of bins proposed by uh, proposed by Seaborn. They try and find something that works well on your data, and most of the time they do it well. And then I will manually set the number of bins here with the bins argument from five, ten, and one thousand to see how that changes how we look at our data. And so you can see that this is the automatic one, and we can sort of see a trend in the data there. And we can see also a little bit of variation around this kind of, maybe there's a bell shape in there and you can see some variation around this bell shape. And if you drastically lower the number of bin, then eh, maybe you see a little bit of a trend, but then it's it's kind of hard to see there. There is maybe too much granularity there to really see the fine, uh, the fine aspect of what's in your data. And with 10 bins, maybe there here, you really focus mostly on the trend. And with 1,000 bin, now you see that the trend is still a bit there, but you focus more and more on the noise, all right? So it, the number of bin is something that depends on the 
on the number of points that you have in the original data, the automatic usually does a good job. But sometimes you have to play a little bit around to find uh, the correct level of granularity uh, with respect to what you want to show. And this is also quite useful because then sometimes you will show different uh, different histogram of different data set with varying number of um, of uh, sorry, varying number of uh, of element in them, and so having a finer control on the bins. There is also a bin width uh, argument that let you use that rather than setting the number of bins, so the number of columns that you will see how wide they should be. So sometimes maybe you would have a width of 0 0.01, so you know exactly which bin correspond to what, and that can also help you combine together different histogram from different sources so that they have corresponding bins and are more comparable, right? And you then also see how we can create multi-panel figures. So here we use the matplotlib function subplots, so plt.subplots, I want two rows, two columns, the figure size will be seven inch by seven inch. Uh, usually this, at least for me on all my screens, they it 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 is 14 inch wide, or something like, I think 12 or 14 each wide. So that gives you also a little guide to how large you can make these. And then this gives you this F and axis object. F is an object that is used to interact with the entire figure at once. So for instance, to create a big overarching title or to save the figure to a file. And then axis is a, here it's a little grid, a list of lists which uh, which you can then use to interact with each individual panel. So for instance, axis zero, zero is top left, zero one is so call uh, row zero, so top line and then right column. Okay, so that's top right and then one zero bottom left and then bottom right for one one. Okay, and they, you just give them using the ax argument of this east plot. So almost all function of um, sorry of uh, of Seaborn have this ax argument so that you can redirect. You, know, you can tell to Seaborn that it should does do its plot in this specific subfigure. All right. So far so good. Yes. Okay. So we start with simple stuff, and you see that can become a bit complex after that. So um, I have shown the histogram plot, uh, and you have seen that the histogram plot could have this density line added on top. But sometimes you may also here want to take directly the density uh, is uh, the density plot without the histogram. For that, it's KDE plot, so kernel density estimation plot then you give it there and then there is this argument which for me is a bit important it's the cut so the default value is two and i'm not always very happy with that i um, let me show you so this is the default but uh here you see that uh, what they do is that they continue their kernel density estimation even beyond the uh the limit of the actual data and so to me, that's a bit problematic because for example, here we are playing with a probability. So we kind of know that there is a limit at zero and one, right? Everything above one is nonsensical and under zero is also nonsensical, but this plot makes, could give us the false impression that there is something in there, all right? So that's actually, personally for me, that's a bit uh, undesirable. And so I do prefer to put the cut to zero. I personally think that they should make that the default, but I'm not a developer. So there you go. Uh, right, so just a little thing to, to think about when you are given such a density plot. Think that sometimes some of this is an estimate and, and may not reflect actual observed values. All right. And then these can be actually uh, combined, okay? Uh, so the, all of these uh, Seaborn plot can be combined with also normal matplotlib element. 
and played with uh, together as you want to create the visualizations that you want. So here, for instance, I create a little function that does something maybe not necessarily super, you know, super, super uh, sensical, but just to showcase a little bit what this does. So here this is a function that takes some data, so just a column and an axe, a matplotlib axis to plot on. And then it will compute the mode, the mean and the median of the column. Here, the mode function may return all the modes, so maybe several modes in the in the in the distribution in case the distribution is bimodal. Here we just pick the first mode, which would be the highest. And then I make an histogram plot here of the column. And then I will add some vertical line for the mean, for the median, for the mode in red, green, and blue, and with different styles. So this one is dashed, solid, and solid. And then with here different labels, and this label will be then used in the legend, which I call here. So everything from this ax, which I plot on. And so then I can create my multi-panel figure and uh, give different column to this plot with mean median mode function and redirect them to different axes. And that will give me this. So here you can see that I have one plot there with mean, median, mode, one other one, and one other one. Here you can see that uh, it's not so looking so nice. There is some overlay, uh, overlap here between the different levels. Uh, the solution for that is to just use this overarching figure element. And then uh, there is a function called tight layout, which forces it to. Um, to recompute a little bit uh, and move around the border between these so that they don't overlap anymore. I give it to you in the chat. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, there is a question uh, by Enge. Uh, so you say that your module C1 has no attribute is plot, and that this is because this should be ist plot with a t. Oh, thank so you. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a typo somewhere. Uh, but there's also because in a in a in an older version of Seaborn, it was is plot. Uh, no, there was this plot, and they have. Change a little bit the name of the function from this plot to his plot, and sometimes can create some problems if you have different versions. But it should be his plot. Uh, yeah, I typed in the his plot, and it still gives me the same error. Ah, okay. Uh, then could you paste in the chat your version of Seaborn? All right. And in the meantime, so we have now this nice little plot, so we can start commenting a little bit of what we see. And so we can see that, for instance, in some case, we can here kind of recognize maybe some sort of, I don't know, a, at least one big mound here. There is a single mode. And you can see that the mean and the median there are both very, very close to one another. So the, di the distribution is what we would call here symmetrical. Okay, And that's when the mean and the median coincide. We can, uh, of course, uh, contrast that with uh, the second one there, where the mean and the median do not coincide. And I guess you can see directly that this is a case where the distribution is non-symmetrical, asymmetrical, all right? OK, and there's a skew toward lower value. OK, and then finally, um, we have here, a case of a distribution with a fraction of reformed, where the uh, distribution is multimodal. Okay, that means that you have several modes, several peaks in your function. And that's a case where the mean and the median become a bit less informative uh, because they don't necessarily represent a typical case of what exists in your. Um, in your in your distribution, so it's why also it's quite important to always 
plot the columns of interest and plot your data and not just rely on single number descriptors because they can be a bit misleading sometimes. Okay, so there is now a second exercise for you. We are going to do this little exercise. I think it will not take too long. So we're going to take, I think again, let's say five to 10 minutes to do it. And then after that, we'll do a correction. And after this correction, we'll do a coffee break. Um, in the meantime, while we do the exercise, if you are experiencing trouble, uh, so there is this question that we were having. So do not hesitate to continue writing in the chat and tell me about your trouble and we try to get you sorted as fast as possible. All right, so I will stop the recording. I'm the recording, share my screen. All right, so this exercise was made of uh, three consecutive questions. Okay, I hope that most people were able to do at least a few histograms and density plots. So who was able to do the first one? Just take uh, a, make a plot of the total number of inhabitants. Please use a little green tick or so on so forth. Who was able to do that? Only a few people? Okay, I see a few more. Perfect. So if there are stuff that are still a bit like problematic and if you are experiencing technical trouble, don't hesitate to let me know. If I don't know there is a problem, I cannot help. So here I call KDE plot because I think that the density plot is what I want. Uh, an histogram might work as well, but yeah, I will go with that. So KDE plot gives me this. And I see I have a very, very big spike here, which must be something around 100. So there is a lot of small commune. And then there are some there, and I see that it goes up until 67. Here, with a little bit of experience, you would maybe guess that you know you have what we call a high dynamical range of the data. So this is good and fine, you know, this is informative, but maybe we could go one step further by saying that, eh, you know, I have some towns which have 10 inhabitants. I think the smallest is 17, sometimes with 100, sometimes with 1,000, sometimes with 10,000, right? So that's kind of huge. Maybe I could do a log 10 transform of this number of inhabitants, and maybe that would kind of smooth things out or let me see a bit more what happens in there. So you can actually just directly do that. So log 10 is obtained with a numpy function. So numpy with as np dot log 10 of my column, and then just give that to east plot. And let's see what we get there. Uh, ah, yes, I need to import numpy. Here, there we go. And there you can see that we have now this visualization of the log 10 transform total number of inhabitants. And I don't know about you, but for me, that actually looks quite uh, quite fine, right? Yeah, uh, I can sort of see, the, if we will, continuity uh, between the small town and the bigger town, all right? And I have here town in the hundreds, and here town in the thousands, and here town in the 10,000. So something also to think about when you look at your data, sometimes you can detect which column could, you know, make a, could could be a bit nicer if you actually do a log transform on them. And that's a very, very, very classical transformation to do on our data. Okay, to do from something a bit weird to something maybe closer to a normal distribution or something where you can have a better grasp in one glimpse of what's in your data. All right, making sense so far? Yes. Okay. So there's another one which I can show you there, another way of doing this. And then the, the result I think is less nice, but nevertheless, it's not uninteresting to know this little trick is that you do your plot and then you, you call this set the X scale as log. And this is what you would get in that particular case. So you see that it's slightly less nice because it has a density. But now you've got here your total and you got the 10 to the power 2, 10 to the power 3, and you, you got your actual scale there so it's it's quite nice to know about in terms of little trick 
Okay, uh, maybe if I change that to a hist plot, that would be better. I've not tried that. Let's check. Maybe that would be horrible. Yeah, it looks weird because then you have this unequal bin size and so on, but you kind of get the idea. All right. For me personally, I think that this one is a bit more appropriate, but I would have to then manually maybe change that to say log 10 of total or something like this. Right. But just to to let you know that, yeah, do not hesitate to play around with these to, to experiment. Okay, so then second question, let's try to call east plot twice in a row, uh, once for the fraction of Swiss and once for the fraction of foreigners. So that's what I did here. And if you do that once and then the other, then you will see that you get actually the two superimposed on the same frame, okay? So then you cannot really know which one is Swiss and which one is foreigners. For instance, what you can do is maybe say that the color here is what sort of color will we choose? Um, I will choose a mint color. I will not go into the detail of all the way that you can name colors. Uh, usually you can try most color, just you can type them out. You can use their X code and I grab some from a special palette, which is the XKCD palette, uh, which I enjoy. And so there, now we have in blue, the fraction of Swiss in mint, the fraction of foreigners. So we can kind of see the symmetry in that. It kind of makes sense, right? When the fraction of Swiss is high, fraction of Swiss is low. Uh, it, they are complementary. Okay. And so that's the second question. And there are third, plot the distribution of the fraction of Catholic in the canton of Zurich. So that's just to go back to what we had done before. So create a mask and then apply that mask and plot the result. So mask fraction of, uh, sorry, uh, people that are in the canton of Zurich. And then people, we have this Catholic column and we apply the mask. So we have the fraction of Catholic in the canton of Zurich and we do a east plot of that. And this is what we get here, simply. All right, so far so good. Everything making sense? All right, good. So um, how about the rhythm? Um, my elocution, the speed at which I, I go through topics and so on and so forth, it works for everyone? Okay, otherwise do not hesitate to tell me to repeat something or, you know, anything. Okay, so then it's 10.34. Let's go on a good 15 minute break where you can go and grab a coffee or, you know, irate yourself a little bit just to stay, you know, stay focused and stay present in the course as we will go through slightly more and more complex topics. So break until, um, that would be then 1050. I will uh, I, I will cut my uh, audio and video, but I will still be around. So if you have technical question or whatever, you can still write them in the chat and I will answer as soon as I'm available. Okay. But otherwise, I wish you a very good break recording. All right. So yeah, um, of course we kind of, scratch really the surface again. So you have here a little link to the Seaborn official tutorial, which will give you, it's quite well done and give you how, you know, how you can go for that, how you can use this uh, to its fullest. We are going to continue to see a little bit how we can represent our different uh, data columns, different uh, data sets in this. So for that, um, I'm going to modify our data a little. And I'm going to uh, create some categorical uh, data columns. Uh, here we can, we could have a look at, uh, at the code briefly. So the idea is um, that I want to create a majority religion, uh, uh, sorry, a majority religion um, uh, a column. So the way that it works is that I select, so to get a majority religion, I select the three uh, columns relating to that. So reformed, Catholic, and other. And so you can imagine that at this point, I have just a data frame with three columns. And uh, let me 
let me cut that in little pieces. Hop, 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 hop. So I have all three. And then I call this IDX max axis one. So what this does is that for, so the axis one means that this will be for each row. I want an index of, you know, if, of the column which has a, ma a maximum value. So here, for instance, is 91, so reformed. And, uh, and here, for instance, this here catholic for the 88. So there we go. And so there you see, I have just a bunch of then labels, reform catholic or other, depending on which one had the maximum fraction for each row. And then I put that information into a new column, majority of religion. And then I do the exact same thing for majority language. So that's here a little trick in order to get my categorical columns. Of course, you want to check that everything went well. And uh, once you have that, you can then compute your matrix, for instance, the mean or median for each groups using the group by function of the data frame. So basically you group by something. Here's a Canton name. I will group all my data by Canton. And that creates a grouped object, which is specific to pandas. And this is this behaves sort of like a data frame, but all operations will be then split among the different categories that you have grouped by. So here, if you call sum rather than having the total sum, you get the sum for all canton. And so in the end, that's here, yeah, the sum of the total number of inhabitants. So that gives us the population of each canton that was registered uh, in 1880. Okay. And then we can sort of start doing stuff. So for instance, we can group by majority language and ask what is the mean fraction of Catholic. So we can get for each majority language, the fraction of Catholic. And for instance, you can see that among Italian speakers, this fraction is 97%, but among German speakers, it's only 38%. Okay, so there might be something different there between these different uh, commune which have different majority language. And uh, this is just to apply let's say classical function, the mean, the medial standard deviation, so on and so forth. Sometimes you will want to apply functions which are not already pre-existing, pre-coded in there. And so you can feel free to just create any function that you want. Okay, so for instance, here I make a silly function that will go and find the town with the minimal index, uh, with the minimal population, so total IDX min, so index associated to the minimal value. And I return the town name and the value of this smallest town. And then I just call apply. So group dot apply. And then I give my custom function and that will apply this custom function to each group. Okay. So this is something that's just a silly example to show you how to apply any custom function to your grouping uh, objects. So there you see here, you have got the smallest uh, town for each count. Okay, so that's all good and well. That lets you group your data in categories and then get some numbers. But as we have seen before, it's also nice to get plots. And for that, the best function I think from Seaborn is cat plot. So you want to plot some categories. Its structure is like this. So you give here which data, where the data comes from. Oh, yes, there's a question by Ahmad. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Can you please go up for the lead uh, group? Yes. So here we say that. We need the uh, the mean of the Catholic who speaks French and German and Italian, or how is how how is it? Yes. So um, here we have uh, whoop, yeah. get in there. So here we use the group by to yeah. create the group by object. So any action that we do after that will always be split by the different categories in the majority language column. Okay. So. Uh, the majority language column has these uh, French speakers, German speakers, Italian speakers, Romance speakers. So if I go and do something like this, it has this category. So any 
action that we do there, rather than giving us a single number, it will split them by category. If I omit the group by, I would get one single number for the whole total. So I remove the group by there. I would just get the whole total mean. And then because you group by, then it will split by the different categories. Makes more sense? Yeah, I understand. I just want to understand uh, to, be, to make sure that we take the mean of the Catholic who speaks the this right? Or it's vice versa. Uh, so this is the mean of the Catholic. So we, we group by language and then the yeah. mean is applied on the Catholic. So it, it, it reads, if you will, from, from left to from left to right. From the left to right. So yeah. For example, if I want to explain this uh, uh, explain this results to someone. So mm -hmm. how I can say, so I, I say these numbers are the mean of the Catholic who speaks this language or yeah. the Catholic. This is, a, this is a mean fraction of Catholic among communes where the majority language is French or the majority language is German or Italian or Romance. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Do not hesitate if you have further questions. All right, so... Uh, to represent categorical values, catplot is, I think, the way to go. So you give the data, this is a data frame, and then you'd specify all along the x-axis will be one column and along the y-axis will be another column. One of these two columns should be categorical. So here it's majority language. And then this is what you get with the default. You got this visualization, which is, uh, it gives you like here a swarm of points. And this is basic, but it works well in many cases. For instance, you can see that here you have uh, if for these green dots here, it's majority high. And then for the other, it's kind of uh, a little bit in both end. And you can see here that your labels are all kind of uh, jumbled and overlapping together. So that's not so nice. In that case, what I like to do is just, you could either spend a bit of time rotating the labels and so on and so forth. That would be a bit ugly. What I prefer doing is just switching X and Y. And most of the time, this solves the problem for me. Okay, that's much, much better. So that's the simplest one, but then Catplot has a different, uh, so different views that it offers to you and they are governed by the kind argument. So there is strip, this is the default that you have seen. There is box for you get a box plot, violent for a violin plot, bar for bar plot, swarm for, it's like strip, but with another way of arranging the point. It takes a long time to compute when you have so many points. So I won't display it here, but if you have a small data set, you can play with that. It's fairly visual, let's say. Boxon is kind of like the child between a box plot and a violin plot and point. So let's demonstrate here for different kinds. Here I go through the kind each time I call cat plot uh, with here, the male fraction as my, uh, as that I represent, that's my continuous function and the majority religion that I show here. And you can see here, I have a further uh, number of arguments. So the kind to govern what this will look like. And then the height and aspect. So the height means says that the created plot will be two inches uh, height. And then the aspect is the width to height ratio. So an aspect of five mean, mean, means that it will be five times more wide than it is high, okay? So that means that if the height is two inches, then the width will be 10 inches. So that's why I have this elongated plot there, which I think when you have only two categories works fairly well. So this is the box plot. I trust you all know the box plot. Everyone knows and have seen the box plot before. Yes. Yes, of course, they are everywhere. The violin plot. So the violin plot shows the density there. And you can see that by default, there is a small box plot included inside, which is nice as well. Uh, then the bar plot with some error bars will come back exactly uh, to this. But you'll see that I don't like bar plot very much. In particular, you see that here, it tells us where things are and how they are spread. We are here, we only have kind of a single information and uh, and a small error bar, which we don't really know what it relates to exactly. Is it a confidence interval? Is it standard error? 
standard deviation. We don't know here. Uh, then the box and plot, so you can see that it's in middle in, in the between the box plot and the variant plot because it takes your box and then it has smaller and smaller boxes around it. Then the swarm, uh, the, sorry, the that's the strip. Yeah, that's the strip plot. So just this is the default. And uh, it's nice when there is not too much point, but there, when there is a lot of point, there's so much overlap there that you get the feeling that the density is higher. But yeah, this is sometimes a bit hard to tell. And then finally, here the points. Uh, yeah, point, which is kind of like the bar plot is just that you remove the bar and you link the different level by uh, by a line there it's not always the best but when you have categories which are ordered uh, so that it makes sense to have a line that goes in between them that can be nice to detect some sort of trend so what we have is that we have a number of visualization and in different kind of data will be will will work more or less with different kind of visualizations so sometimes you have to try several or you have to know a little bit about the nature of your data to know which uh, visualization is the most uh, appropriate so let's go and see some of the most common ones together the box plot first uh, we see box plot everywhere they are nice because even when they are super small so in a very small uh, panel uh, sub panel of a figure, they still convey quite a number of information. Uh, and in a visual, in a simply, uh, uh, sorry, fairly simply, like it, it doesn't need to be super large to convey a number of information. So um, this is the anatomy of the box plot. So box plot is made of a box and whiskers and eventually outliers. Outliers is just the internal term for them. That doesn't mean that they are actual statistical outlier. And so that should not be necessarily removed from your uh, data set. It's just what we call them. So the box is made of the median. So there is 50% of the data on the right and on the left. Then the, uh, the limit of the box is the first quartile and third quartile. So there is 25% of the data in there. 25% of the data in there. And so the box represents 50% of your data. And then the whiskers here will extend as much as possible up to 1.5 times this, the length of the box with this interquartile range here, there. And it will extend as much as possible, but still anchor itself toward an actual absurd value. That's why despite the fact that the limit of 1.5 times the interquartile range is here, the whiskers only goes up till there because there is here the point which is the closest to that and still under, or it's still inside this range. And then everything that is above this gray line there, in above 1.5 times the interquartile range, is here these little dots that appears outside of the whiskers. Okay. Um, the 1.5 time uh, interquartile range is sort of a, let's say, a, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you say that? It's it's a heuristic, uh, if you will. That's most of the time this works fairly well when you don't have a ton of points, okay? But when you have a lot of points, when you have like thousands, tens of thousands of points, there will always be some point in the outlier there. As you can see, here, for example, we have a few thousands of points. And so there is a lot of points which are outside of this 1.5 uh, interquartile range. Just because we have so many points, our sample is so large that, of course, sometimes we have some points which are slightly, fall slightly outside of uh, the distribution. That's completely expected. And that's, I would say, maybe one of the limits of the box plot there. But nevertheless, you can see that in a few elements, it can convey a number of information. Box plots are very powerful. Personally, I like them a lot. But where they fail is when your data is multimodal. So here I show you, for instance, the fraction of reform, um, uh, fraction of German speakers uh, in different majority religion. And here you can clearly see that the distribution is multimodal. Okay, there is one big uh, 
blotch of data there and one bin blotch of data there around one around zero. But if you do a box plot of that, well, it's not clear to understand what happens, right? It this here could also be the same if you had completely uniform spread all along the all along the all along the the, the range of the data. So we have to be a bit careful there, and I would always recommend that you use a couple of different visualization um, because otherwise you might be tricked into thinking false thing about your data if you just use one simple kind of representation. So the so next is the violin plot. So the violin plot is a simple density representation. This is what it looks like. Okay. And here you can see that now it's actually able to uh, to circumvent the problem of the box plot because there you clearly see that the kind of bimodal nature of the data. Okay. And uh, so I like also Vine plot a lot. Um, I, in my experience, the thing is that when you don't have a lot of visual space, when you have to make a tiny figure, the violin plot uh, becomes a bit harder to interpret, and the box plot because it's much, uh, it's much more summarized, if you will. For a small plot, it works a bit better. Okay, um, that's just the way that you know it works. Like when you have less information, you need less space to encode it. Uh, but nevertheless, that's actually a great thing. Um, one little caveat, exactly like the um, like the KDE plot. Here, you see that this goes beyond the range of actual values. So we have fraction that goes beyond one and under zero. So that's something that I think you most of the time want to correct. So just with this cut equals zero argument, okay? And then you get something which I think is much maybe truer to the nature of the data. So um, a bit better. Also, because you have then less range, you can focus uh, a bit more the visual space toward the range of the actual data. There are more options, of course. You can remove this little. Um, you can remove this uh, little uh, this little box plot inside if you don't like them. You can put uh, you can put little bars at each of the points. You can make a half violin plot uh, to have you know half of the violin plot of one category, half of another category, and so on and so forth. These are fairly simple options of uh, the violin plot, which are all in the documentation of Seaborn. So again. If you are interested, I urge you to go and look at them uh, after the course. Okay, so we have seen, I would say, maybe two of my favorites, which are the box plot and violin plot. Now let's go to the one which I don't like, and I'm not alone. Many other researchers don't like them, and I hope I will convey to you why um, we like to have. Yeah, uh, we would like to be a bit. Uh, a bit, uh, a bit, um, let's say, defined against bar plots because they are everywhere, but they don't convey that much information and they can be hard to interpret. So um, a bar plot basically is just a bar that goes up until the mean of the data. Okay, so it just conveys you one information with the bar, the mean, and then it has an error bar which conveys to you another information, but it might be uh, most of the time, a standard deviation or a 95 confidence interval. So we'll come back on that this afternoon or what exactly is a confidence interval and how to compute it. But basically, it's two times sigma, so the standard uh, the, yeah, standard deviation divided by something that depends on the number of points in the bar. Okay. And the problem is that most of the time, a lot of people will show bar plots with confidence uh, with uh, error bars and not indicate clearly if this error bar is a standard deviation or confidence interval or standard error mean and so on and so forth. And that changes quite a lot. These are very different. So let me show you, for instance, here, yeah, if I say CI equal SD, that means that the confidence, the bar, error bar will be standard deviation. If I say 95, this will be the 95 can confidence interval. And so here, this is standard deviation. Here, this is 95 confidence interval. And you can see that it paints very different pictures. Uh, that means that if you 
don't know if you didn't know that this was a 95 confidence interval and thought that this was maybe a standard deviation, the way that you think about the data will change quite a bit. So you can use bar plot, but always, always be super explicit as to what the error bar mean exactly, okay? Because they are different definitions, so we have to be very clear about that. And now a little bit of a caveat, I'm going to go to this external shiny help there. I think it's uh, to me kind of a nice visual demonstration of why we should use different kind of visualization and why this is an important uh, thing to look at. Uh, so here are different different columns, different uh, different little data sets with each a very uh, a very specific profile, right? So here the first one has two blotches of data, okay, which are clearly separate. And this one is maybe more one one big spread, okay. Then here there is one one uh, sorry one group of data which is, which has most of the point and a smaller group with less point. Then one again when these are just inverted. Then here three blotches of data, one bigger than the two others, and then four blots uh, with exactly one value each time, and separated and equally separated. Okay, so each of them are clearly different and separate. And if you just do a bar plot of these, the bar plot, because it only shows you the standard error and uh, and, the, and the mean, you lose all of this information then and they look exactly or almost exactly the same. You lose all of the fine grain information and you may think that they are the same where in fact they are not at all. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, uh, but uh, I can see here this for the scatter plot, box plot, the only plot, the y axis are measured, I think so, uh, while the bar plot is different, uh, different, uh, different. Plot. Yeah, it it's here? it says that there's the mean. Yeah, because uh, the so it's on the same scale, but because the because the bar shows you the mean, so that's why they sh they change the they change the legend here. Okay, but they are the same scale, right? Yeah, they are the same scale. Yeah. So that's why the bar plot, I mean, it's nice because again, if, if a figure is super tiny, then the bar plot only conveys very simple information. Uh, so it's it's nice for that. But then for other thing, when you make a larger figure, then using a bar plot is just basically just putting two information in a very large visual space. So it's not super, not the best use of the space and it can hide a lot of interesting information. Here you can see that the bar plot is a bit better, but still uh, it has trouble. Like here, you lose the fact that you are multimodal. Here it's, okay, here you see it because there is one splotch which is here, which is much more, uh, much more and cluster, which is much more prevalent than the other, okay? And there you lose completely the fact that you have four points which are kind of, uh, which are equally distant and have a single value. The variant plot is a bit better, fares a bit better there, but still gives some a bit, uh, a bit of a weirdness here. Okay, so there is this like no one visualization will always work. Okay, so always use several. To me, I would say always use the scatter plot, so that's the strip in cat plot, and one other. Okay, so we can have these different views, and then. The strip, I would say, is kind of oftentimes the one which um, is very rarely tricked, let's say, and can be very informative. The problem is that as soon as you have too much point, you can see that here yes, they overlap so much that you get just the idea that there is a highest density, but not much more. You don't know exactly what this density is. And so it becomes a bit less informative than the violin plot. So there's never one perfect uh, visualization. We have to compose, we have to play around, and we have to try several until we find one that fits our our purpose for showing the data and our and also that stays true to the data, of course. So 
I'm not the only one in saying that. Uh, so you have here a few article uh, talking about bar chart and possible alternative. This is a literature which is not an interesting, and I will come back to a few results uh, later on about how to efficiently uh, and truthfully show our data. All right, let's now see together how we can try and go a bit further than that and see how we can show several categorization at once. And this is a nice uh, argument. So there is in almost all function of uh, Seaborn, there is a hue argument. So basically you take the KDE plot that we had before, and you had a hue corresponding to a category. So here, our category will be the majority religion. So I want to show the, uh, sorry, Italian speaker uh, and split by majority religion. And so this is what this looks like. Here you see that now I don't get a single line, but I can one line per categories in this majority religion column. Okay, with different colors and here a little ledge. All right. And so this works for the KDE plot, for the hist plot, but also for the cat plot. So let's now see what this looks like with the categorization by majority language and majority religion. One will be along uh, an axis and the other will be along uh, used with the hue there. Okay, and also you see here my little trick to have log scale because when I represent the total number of inhabitant with the log scale, it works much, much better. So now you see here what I have. So I have here on the top among German speaker, among French speaker, among Italian, among Romanche, and then the one with majority reform, majority Catholic, reform Catholic, reform Catholic, and so on. So you can see all of these different values there. Here with the histogram, it works quite well. The violin plot doesn't like the log transform a lot. It does some weird stuff, all right? Here, the bar plot, because we have very little visual space, I think it's not too, too bad, all right? Uh, the boxon plot is not so bad as well. Here, the swarm plot, we see basically nothing. And here, the, um, the points is like the bar plot, but I think that there is a little bit less clutter. So it's actually quite nice as well. All right. So you can see just by adding this hue parameter, we have added a new level of categorization uh, in our in our visualization. So it's quite nice. Don't overuse it, but it's quite powerful. Yes, there is a question. Yeah, I just want to understand what is the difference between the box and box plot, the okay. first and the fourth one. Yes. So the box plot will just show one box going from the first quartile to the third quartile. Uh, whereas you see here that the boxon uh, shows more boxes. And I I think, if I remember correctly, that they go through the different decile, uh, but I'm not sure 100%. And I think that this can be tuned uh, with, the, with the arguments. So I can look it up if you want. Yeah, That's the idea. It's just creating more plot, more boxes. OK, so now it's, I think, your turn to play. We have seen different stuff. We have seen the cat plot. We have seen the U and so on and so forth. So go around and play with them. So exercise for you to represent the proportion of people, of people that are more than 60 year old across all cantons. OK, try to play around with different visualization and try to find one which suits your purpose. OK, so I will then stop recording. So we want to represent the proportion of people more than 60 years old across all cantons. So I'm going to load the solution. So the idea is that our category will be the canton name. The present variable will be the number of people who are more than 60 plus year old. OK, so I think that for me, I will go with the idea that our category is, so because it's canton name, we know that there are many, right? So df uh, canton name dot uh, unique. Here you see there are all of these canton to represent. Okay, so we'll have 
to fit a lot of information in this. So then from that, we can, here I go, for instance, with box, but we could go, for instance, with the default strip. And that, I think, will look ugly. So we do a strip plot of the fraction for the 16 plus year old spread by canton name. So I do this. And here you can see that already this is not too, too bad. OK, this gives us a bit of information. Uh, we can kind of see some trend appearing here and there. So it's, I think, fairly informative. The default kind of rainbow scale here, I think, uh, I, I find it useful. Maybe it's not the most beautiful, but it's useful for just this data exploration purpose. Um, so that's not too bad. Maybe I could have a bit more information, I think, with box. So here, box will give me directly the median. And so I can see already that now, more clearly, that the median kind of shift a lot from canton to canton. OK, this is maybe, to me at least, a bit clear to see the different patterns or to make judgment based off of that. All right. Have you tried some different things? Maybe a bar plot, maybe a variant plot? No one? No one had tried something different? If you try a violin plot, uh, so it's just violin, then you can see that now visually you don't have enough space here to be, uh, for it to be really worth it. Maybe if I change the height to 15 and change the aspect so that the width to height ratio would be a bit better, then this would be a bit nicer. Uh, but then it doesn't fit on my screen anymore. All right. But that's always things that we can play with. Up, up, up. Let me come back to that. And then that's but not least. I don't know if you've seen, I've added this little plt.grid argument there. I think to me, this helps also interpretation and this helps follows exactly what is what when you have a little grid visible. So that's also a nice little trick to have. Okay. So far, so good. Everything is still making sense. All right. So, so far, we are seeing a bunch of tricks to just play and represent our data. All right. So last but not least, once you have maybe modified, create a few, created a few columns and so on and so forth, you will want to, uh, you will want to write your, maybe your, um, your table and your plot to the disk. So here for you have your data frame, it's just called dot to CSV or to Excel or to whatever, depending on what you want to do, but generally to CSV. And then the name of the file that you want to write in, and that's it. It's simple enough, right? Of course, there are some options. How do you want to encode NAs? How do you want to write true and false? Do you want to write a header or not? And so on. But the basic usage is very, very simple. And then for a plot, it's as simple as just creating the plot exactly as before. And then at the end, calling, so you save your plot in a variable and then your variable dot save fig, and then the name of the file that you want. And Python is not too dumb. It will automatically detect the, um, the, um, extension that you've chosen and we'll save it as that. So .pdf, .png, .jpeg, .svg, all the classical ones are already uh, you know, known by Python. And here the default usually gives something fairly nice, but of course you can manually uh, give arguments about the height and width in pixel or inches and the dot per inches argument and so on and so forth to have full control of exactly what sort of thing you are saving. Okay, and when you do a multi-panel figure, uh, here you have this fig F and axis element, and then the safe fig is done with this F element, which is the one that controls overarching, you know, the overarching figure stuff. So here, for instance, I save the whole thing as PDF. You see that it's still shown there, but it's also saved uh, here, and I will show you that in a moment. If I come here, you can now. See that I have my output.png that was created seconds ago and, and output multi-panel also 
So this is my PNG file. And this is, yeah, my PDF file. Okay. All right. So that's, I would say, in general, far from the most complex thing to do to save figures in Python. All right. So now what's left to me to kind of conclude this part is to talk a bit more about just data visualization, what sort of data visualization work well and what really don't, just to steer you slightly away from that. So, and there is some research done on that. So I will mostly use the figure from this uh, 1984 paper. And what they did basically is that they wanted to compare different kinds of visualization. So on one side, you have here a pie chart. And on the other side, you have the exact same information than the pie chart, but as a, you know, basically bar chart, right? And uh, and they just asked people to make then judgment, like what do you think, which one do you think is the largest? Is it A or is it C? Or is it B or is it E? And by how much do you think uh, E would be larger than B? And then they ask people like where they only showed the pie chart, people where they only showed that and compared how much they got it right or wrong. And then they did the same thing with this different kind of bar chart. So either you want to compare two columns just right close to one another or two which are slightly separated or two which are far away or two, but they are now on stack columns so they don't have the same basis or two which are stacked among one another. And so that's what then they call kind of position or length judgment. So that's position here, judgment. And here, this is length judgment. And this is here, position represents that one. And here, the angle represents the last one. And this is basically here, a presentation of the sort of error that people make. So the lower, the less error people make, so the better. And what you can see, and I'm sure that you expected that, is that basically when you have a pie chart, it's much, much worse. People make more, much more error than when you'd give them this bar chart here. Okay, kind of makes sense. Here, it's very easy to compare the bar. Here, our brain have to make a bit more work. We can get there, but it's not as obvious. And then same thing here. We can see that it's much harder there to, for instance, compare these two lengths here than to just compare these two bar next to one another. Or okay. Again, I think this is simple enough. I think this makes a lot of sense, but uh, it's, it's a good thing to just remember and uh, to clearly see that and to remember this effect because when we create visualization, we have to remember this. We have to remember that people, we have to then look at our data and interpret it. And if we can make it less of a cognitive load for them to understand our data, then we will be that much more impactful and convincing when showing our data. So pie chart in general are not ideal, prefer bar chart, it's much better. And if you are ever shown a 3D bar chart shown like that, a runaway, I would say. That means that you have, you have either someone who is incompetent at creating visualization or that tries to sell you something and tries to scam you because here, the angle that is visually shown is actually not representative of the actual angle. So you actually do uh, distort the the representation that, that the people have. And there have been studies done on this effect. And the perception that people have is indeed skewed by that purely visual effect. So that's actually a great scamming tactic that was used everywhere in commercial presentation, including in stuff by Apple to kind of oversell their success and so on and so forth. So yeah, be very uh, be, be very mindful of that effect. And last but not least, uh, one small uh, GIF, which I like. Uh, so you can go from something like this, very complex. And actually, when you think about it, if you want to show like what you want to show, you, make, you can make it much simpler, remove the 3D, it's useless, and maybe replace your pie chart with a simple 
uh, with a simple bar chart. And if there is one thing in particular which you want to make pop up, then color only that and not the rest. I mean, there is already the label. We don't need to have color everywhere. Okay, this is better than the original. All right, so just here a few key ideas. I know this is a lot, but just something to think about when you create visualization sometime, go for something simple. Okay, do we have question at this stage or is everything still going well? All good? Okay, so I know this was a fairly long intro, uh, not too much stat for now, a little bit with median, with the mean and so on. But that's just to ensure that we have all these same basis. And as I said, being good at data exploration and representation makes the rest that much easier. If that is a topic that interests you and you want to know more, we are also giving at SIB a data analysis and representation course with Python. So the next edition will take place in, uh, in November. Okay, it's not open yet, but stay tuned. And if you cannot wait, the material is anyway already fully available on GitHub. So that's this course one there. And you have here a lot of stuff about data manipulation and presentation, much, much more than what I'm showing here, if that's interesting to you.